Hi everyone, starting in learning outcome number two, we're only gonna be covering the skeletal muscle. In this specific learning outcome, we will be talking about the anatomy of the skeletal muscle. It is important to realize that each skeletal muscle is actually a separate organ that's going to be composed of hundreds to thousands of skeletal muscle cells. And these skeletal muscle cells, they can also be called muscle fibers, because they have this elongated shape, or actually myocytes, which are muscle cells, myocytes. Now, the connective tissues that surround the muscle fibers and the whole muscle, they can carry the blood vessels and the nerves that are going to exert their specific effect on the individual muscle fibers. But to understand how the contraction of the skeletal muscle works, we first need to learn about the gross and microscopic anatomy of the individual fibers. So here we have a typical skeletal muscle that will consist of a muscle belly, as we can see over here, connected by tendons to the skeleton. As we can see on this image to the right, we are going to have the biceps brachii, which is this muscle over here that will attach not only to the humerus, but also part of it will attach to the scapula, and then the other end of it will attach right over here to the radius. For right now, you guys really don't need to pay much attention to where they are either originating or inserting. We will cover this in more details when we get to the next module. This radish or meat-like appearance that we usually associate with the muscular tissue has to do with the fact that this organ is very well vascularized. So it means that it has a lot of blood vessels. Therefore, a lot of blood circulating through this organ and that's why it does have this color. This blood, as you can imagine, will be important for nourishment, for oxygen delivery, and also for waste removal. In addition, every muscle fiber in a skeletal muscle is going to be supplied by the axon of a neuron, more specifically what we call a somatic motor neuron, which we will see in the upcoming slides. And this axon is going to be important as it will be the structure that will send the signals for the fibers to be able to contract. Remember that unlike the cardiac and smooth muscles, which are autorhythmic, the only way to functionally contract a skeletal muscle is through the signaling from the nervous system. Now the belly of the muscle can be elongated, like we see over here, thick, rounded, or triangular in shape. It all depends on the type of muscle that it is. And according to the shape, it will have different functions as well. But we don't really need to pay much attention to those right now. In contrast to the skeletal muscle, the tendons, they're going to be this very tough, sort of glistening, white, dense, regular connective tissue structures that, are, like I said previously, are going to attach the muscle belly to the bones. And because they have this whitish color, as you can imagine, they don't have a lot of blood vessels, so they have very little blood vessels. They will also lack muscle cells and they will consist primarily of these parallel arrangements of collagen fibers. Just like the muscle belly, the tendons, they also will display this great variety of shapes. Some are gonna be long, others are going to have like this rope-like structure, while others are going to be arranged in this flat sheet that's called aponeurosis, as we can see over here on this image which represents the epicranial aponeurosis. So epi on top, cranial on the cranium, and it's this sheet of tendons. So epicranial aponeurosis. As we have mentioned already, each skeletal muscle is going to be an organ that will consist of various integrated tissues. These tissues include the skeletal muscle fibers, the blood vessels, the nerves, which we already talked about all these, in addition to connective tissue, which is what we're going to cover on this slide. Each skeletal muscle has three layers of connective tissue. These are the endomysium, the perimysium, and the epimysium.
I like to start with the smallest structure first. Right over here we have the, what we call the myofibril, which is going to be made up of several proteins that will come together to form what we call the muscle fiber, which can also be called the muscle cells. And these proteins can be, for example, actin and myosin, which are proteins that you guys have heard of already. And there are several other proteins as well. So again, these proteins will form the myofibril, which will come together to form the muscle fiber or the muscle cells. The muscle fibers, they will be wrapped up by this internal connective tissue layer, which is called the endomysium endo for inside and this endomysium it's going to be formed by collagen and reticular fibers then a group of muscle fibers are going to come together and be wrapped up by the perimysium which is the middle layer and this layer is made up of lots of collagen fibers which will then form a bundle that's called a fascicle so a fascicle is when you have several muscle fibers together and a fascicle is wrapped up by the perimysium. Then when you have lots of fascicles together, it will form what we call the skeletal muscle, which will be wrapped up by the epimysium, which is the last layer, epi meaning on top. And this connected tissue is also made up by this very dense layer of collagen fibers. And because the tendon is made up of collagen fibers as well, you can see how the epimysium will be continuous with the tendon over here that will then attach to the bone. On this image, we have isolated a muscle fiber or a muscle cell. You can see how it's going to contain these nuclei that's going to be located on the periphery of the cell. It will be formed by several of these myofibrils. Remember, I said on the previous slide, and these myofibrils are going to be made up of several proteins. The two main proteins that you need to know are myosin and actin. Myosin is what we call a thick filament, and actin is what we call a thin filament. And notice how they overlap each other. So myosin is represented by these bands of purple lines over here, and the actin filaments are represented by the green lines, and they do overlap. And this overlapping is going to be important for muscle contraction. So keep this in mind as we move on to the next few slides. You can also notice how there's going to be a pattern of what we call a dark band over here alternating with a light band in the middle. So these are light bands and this one would be a dark band. And this pattern is what gives us the striation when we said that the skeletal muscles are striated. Also notice how there's going to be areas where you're going to have thick filament with some thin filament, but there's also going to be areas where you only have thin filament, which is the actin. And therefore, we can say that half of this light area with another half of another light area together with the area where they overlap with the thick filament is going to form what we call a sarcomere, which is the functional unit of the skeletal muscle. And we will talk more about the sarcomere on the next slide. Something else that I want to highlight on this image are some of the terms that we use for muscles. Because the muscles, they are very specific in their function, the structures that form this cell will receive specific names that are similar to the names that we find in the other common cells. So pay attention to this term, for example, sarcolemma. So sarco means flesh. And this is going to be the membrane of this muscle cell. Remember that a plasma membrane can also be called plasma lima. So that's where the sarcolemma comes from. Same thing with sarcoplasmic reticulum, which will have a similar function to the endoplasmic reticulum that you guys have heard of. 
So just keep this in mind as we move on and you see those terms that start with circle that are specific for muscle cells, but that will have similar functions to similar names that we see in other cells. So again, this is your sarcomere, which is the functional unit of the skeletal muscle fiber. One thing that I want you to keep in mind in this image is that this muscle is relaxed. And how do I know this? I know this because the overlapping of the thin filament, which is the green line, with the thick filament, which is the purple, is very tiny. So there's only a little bit that is overlapping. If they were closer together, it would mean that this muscle fiber would be contracting. I don't want you to memorize all of the letters that we see on these images, but there are a few that you need to know. One of them is the Z line. So a sarcomere is formed between two Z lines, which are these right over here. And for now, these are all the letters that I need you to know. Let's focus a little bit on the thick filament, which is the myosin. The myosin is going to have two heads. These heads will have what we call an actin binding site, where it will bind to the actin filament, which is this filament right over here. After the heads, we're going to have what we call a neck region, which is going to be the flexible region. And then we have what we call a tail. So the myosin is a protein that's formed by two heads that have an actin binding site, a neck, and a large coiled tail. And the thin filament is formed mainly by actin, which are represented here by these green circular structures. It will also contain two other proteins, which are tropomyosin and troponin. Now notice how within the actin subunits, you're going to have the binding site for the myosin. Remember how on the myosin head, you had the actin binding site? Well, this head will attach right over here to the myosin binding site on the actin. On the next few slides, we will cover specifically how these proteins will function. The proteins, they're going to be grouped into three different categories. We have what we call the contractile proteins, which are the ones that will generate the force during contraction. And this will be the myosin and the actin. Then we have what we call the regulatory proteins, which are going to be the ones that will control when the muscle is contracting and when the muscle is relaxed. And these will be your tropomyosin and your troponin. Then we have what we call the structural proteins, which are going to be important because they're going to be the ones that will keep the thick and the thin filaments together. In addition, all of these proteins, they're going to be important because they will give the myofibrils the elasticity and the extensibility that they need to be able to contract. And they will also be important because they will link the myofibrils to the sarcolemma, remember that it's the plasma membrane of the muscle cells, and to the extracellular matrix. Let's cover first the contractile proteins in muscles, which are again the myosin and the actin, and they are the components that will form the thick and the thin filaments of the sarcomere. As we have learned already, the thick filament will be formed by the myosin protein, while the thin filament will be formed mainly by the actin filaments. The myosin is going to be important because it's going to function as the motor protein and will be present in all three types of muscle tissue that we covered, so the cardiac, the smooth, and the skeletal. In fact, there are at least 15 different types of myosin proteins, all having to do with movement. For example, the myosin that helps neurons migrate from one area of the brain to another area of the brain are called the myosin 5 or brain myosin 5. And like I said previously, the actin is going to be the major component of the thin filament because we know that the thin filament is also formed by the tropomyosin and the troponin, which are the next category of proteins that are called regulatory proteins.
Here we have the regulatory proteins, which, like I said, are the tropomyosin and the troponin, and they're called regulatory because they will be the ones that will regulate if a muscle contraction will occur or not. And how do they do this? Well, mainly the tropomyosin is going to be important because it will cover the myosin binding sites that are going to be important for myosin to come and bind to the actin molecule. And the troponin is important because the troponin is what will hold this tropomyosin in place. So the tropomyosin, again, it blocks the myosin binding sites, and the troponin is what holds these tropomyosin protein in place. Next, we have what we call structural proteins. There are several of them. The one that I really want you to know is Titan, which I drew over here. Titan will actually anchor the thick filament from one Z line to the middle line, which is called the M line. So that's what Titan is important for. Maybe dystrophin you guys have heard of because there's a disease that's called muscular dystrophy where there's a deficiency of this protein but we won't get into details about this in this module now that we have talked about all the different structures that form the skeletal muscle fiber we can talk a little bit about what the neuromuscular junction is which is where you're going to have a muscle contraction occur so these are the structures that belong to this junction to this area of course, it's called neuromuscular, meaning that there's going to be a neuron and a muscle in this location. Therefore, when we have the combination of what we call a somatic motor neuron and a skeletal muscle fiber, this communication is what we call a synapse. So the communication is going to go from the neuron to the skeletal muscle to send the information that this muscle needs to contract. Now, I know we have not covered nervous system yet, but I thought it was important to add this image so that when I talk about a somatic motor neuron or an axon terminal or a synaptic end bulb, synaptic vesicles, you guys know what these structures are and what I'm referring to. So let's go step by step. Here is a neuron. The neuron is going to have this big cell body and the dendrites. The information is going to come down this long structure that's called the axon. And at the end of the axon, you're going to have these finger-like projections that are called an axon terminal. Within the axon terminal, at the end of these projections, we're going to have these structures that become a little bit more wider that are called synaptic end bulbs. So they look like the bulb of a plant. Inside of these synaptic end bulbs, we're going to have these vesicles that are called synaptic vesicles. These synaptic vesicles, they're going to contain neurotransmitters. More specifically for this neuromuscular junction, the neurotransmitter is going to be acetylcholine which will be important for muscle contraction. Now notice how there is a space between the synaptic end bulb and the next membrane, which belongs to the muscle. And this membrane is what we call the motor end plate, which is defined over here as the region of the sarcolemma, so the membrane, that's opposite to the synaptic end bulb. And this space is what we call the synaptic cleft. Now it's important to notice that each skeletal muscle fiber, it has only a single neuromuscular junction, but the axon of a somatic motor neuron, see how it branches out right over here? And this will form a neuromuscular junction with many different muscle fibers. Therefore, we can say that a somatic motor neuron and all the skeletal muscles, fibers that it stimulates, is what we call a motor unit.